Shalom and welcome back to another episode of Ezra International's It's All About the Aliyah. You know, for over 25 years now, Ezra International has been helping the poorest of the poor Jewish people make it home to the land of Israel, the land of their biblical destiny. Today's episode, we're going to talk about the time to favor Zion. Hi, I'm your host, Gary Christofero. And when we think about favoring Zion, we have to think back to the Abrahamic covenant. I spent the entire first episode of this program talking about the covenant that God made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the eternal and unconditional nature of it. In fact, I'm going to turn to Psalm 105 and remind us of what God's words say about this promise. Psalm 105 says, O give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. You know, I want to pause right there for a moment and say, you know, that's exactly what this program is about, making known the deeds among the peoples. When it, when it, when it speaks of the peoples in the uh, scripture, it speaks of the nations, it speaks of making known uh, what God is doing among the nations for the people of Israel. And that is what I wanted to accomplish with this program that, w- that is going out literally to every nation on the earth. You know, at one time I was riding across uh, Texas, going from place to place, ministering uh, the word regarding uh, God's promises to Israel. And and a long stretch of lonely highway, I was alone with my own thoughts, and I heard the voice of God in it, you know, his, his Spirit speaking into my thoughts, saying, you don't have to preach. All you have to do is brag on my faithfulness. And boy, was, was that a freeing moment, because I know that just being able to brag on God's faithfulness is so easy. It's, 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 uh, you know, it, it's on display especially in our generation, but for the last, you know, for a number of thousands of years, God has been faithful to his word and um, bragging on his accomplishments, <laughs> bragging on his faithfulness is something that comes very easy and very natural. The word goes on to say, sing to him, sing psalms to him, talk of his wondrous works, glory in his holy name. Amen. Hallelujah. Let the hearts of those rejoice who seek the Lord. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face forevermore. Remember his marvelous works which he has done, his wonders, his judgments of his mouth. O seed of Abraham, his servant, you chosen children of Jacob, his chosen ones. Chosen ones. I like to use the term a representative, a representative people. They were chosen to represent him. They were chosen to be the, the, the vessel in which God could do all the things that he promised he would do uh, regarding the redemption of the entire world. They are his representative people. They help us to understand who the one true God is. You know, everybody has their idea about who is God. And some even just think of him in generic terms. But God was very specific in, 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 in uh, identifying himself with a people and a place. The God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the Holy One of Israel. He goes on to say, He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in the earth. He remembers his covenant forever. The word which he commanded for a thousand generations, the covenant which he made with Abraham, his oath to Isaac, and confirmed it to Jacob for a statute to Israel as an everlasting covenant. Everlasting saying to you, I will give the land of Canaan as the uh, as the allotment for your inheritance. You see, there's this intrinsic link between God of Israel, the land of Israel, and the people of Israel. You, they, they cannot be separated because God is accomplishing all that he said he would do, accomplish through his people and in his land. So that's, that's such, such an important thing for us to remember. This covenant, uh, Hebrews 6, verse 13 through 18 tells us that because God could swear by no one greater, he swore by his own name. Because by these two immutable things, the fact that God can't lie and the oath itself, uh, we know that God is 
continuing to keep his promise even in our generation. It's so important for us to remember because so much error has been um, perpetrated and, and taught in the church because of this idea that God had somehow turned his back on the Jewish people. He has not. The only place we find conditions regarding the Jewish people is in the Mosaic Covenant. And once again, I'm not going to spend as much time today uh, on these two covenants, but go back to episode one if you want to, to hear more about the difference between the Abrahamic Covenant and the Mosaic Covenant. But in the Mosaic Covenant, we do find these conditions, this co the conditions for obedience and disobedience. Res the results of uh, their disobedience are, is the reason why we see, we see Jewish people in the lands uh, around the world still today. Verse 15 of Deuteronomy 28 begins the, the change in the narrative. Prior to verse 15, God is speaking of all the blessings that he will bestow on the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob through Moses now. He's talking to the nation of Israel, talking about the blessings for their obedience, how much they will be a blessed, holy, set-apart nation. But if they disobey, but, verse 15, it shall come to pass if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments and his statutes, which I command you today, that these curses will come upon you and overtake you. And as I've shared with you before, those curses are up to and including the idea of being scattered from the land. They lose their right of domicile in the land. Verse 64 says, Then the Lord will scatter you among all peoples from one end of the earth uh, to the other. And there you shall serve other gods and neither that neither you and your fathers have known wood and stone. And among those nations you shall find no rest, nor shall the sole of your foot have a resting place but there the Lord will give you a trembling heart, failing eyes, and anguish of soul. And as I said in, in our previous episode, that doesn't mean emotional issues for the Jewish people for the rest of their lives. It means that there is no place on earth that they will find the peace that they have in their own nation. There will always be at some point, uh, even after generations and generations in a, in a particular land, there'll be some point where they know that they need to return home to the land of Israel. And that's the way God set it up. Uh, chapter 30, verse uh, 4 and 5 says this, and if any of you are driven out to the farthest parts under heaven, from there the Lord God will gather you, and from there he will bring you. Then the Lord your God will bring you to the land which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it. He will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. You see, no matter where they go, no matter what happens, uh, God will never forget, and he will always bring them back to their own land. Okay? And so we see. The reason we can, we can speak of the time to favor Zion is because since 1948, we have the nation of Israel back in her own land. We're going to turn to Isaiah 66 and read that prophecy. This has to be uh, the watershed moment of watershed moments. I mean, this is the, the, the greatest fulfillment of, of prophecy that we can see outside of the, of the Messiah's coming and the Messiah's return. Because with the rebirth of the nation of Israel, all of these other prophecies, all of these other promises that God made can now be uh, put into motion, can be fulfilled. Um, in Isaiah 66, verse 7 through 9, I hope you're familiar with this passage, but verse 7 says, before she was in labor, she gave birth. Before her pain came, she delivered a male child. Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall the earth be made to give birth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion was in labor, she gave birth to her children. Shall I bring that time of birth and not cause delivery, says the Lord? Shall I who cause delivery shut up the womb, says your God? Of course not. But rejoice with Jerusalem and be glad with her, all you who love her. You know, this, this moment occurred on May 14th, 1948. 
when David Ben-Gurion declared the statehood of the nation of Israel. And before that time, there could not have been a nation born in a day. There was no United Nations before 1945. And there was no League of Nations when Isaiah made this prophecy. How could a nation be born in a day? Nobody had seen such a thing. But within minutes, literally minutes after David Ben-Gurion made the declaration of statehood in the, for, the, for the nation of Israel once again, the United States recognized her legitimacy, and then others followed. But a nation born in a day, how could Isaiah have known had not been for the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the, our Holy God? So miraculous things uh, have happened in, in view of the generation that we're still currently living in. There are many of you out there who were alive when David Ben-Gurion made this declaration, and some of us born shortly thereafter. So we, we, we know that this is something that our generation is blessed to witness. Then we go to our, our passage that I, I brought the title of this message from Psalm 102. Let me read a few verses from it. Psalm 102, verse 12. But you, O Lord, shall endure forever, and the rem remembrance of your name to all generations. You will arise and have mercy on Zion, for the time to favor her, yes, the set time has come. For your servants take pleasure in her stones and show favor to her dust, so the nations shall fear the name of the Lord and all the nations on earth your glory. For the Lord shall build up Zion, he shall appear in his glory. He shall regard the prayer of the destitute and shall not despise their prayer. And listen to this. This will be written for the generation to come that a people yet to be created may praise the Lord. A people yet to be created at the time of this writing will praise the Lord because they will see these things. You know, I have seen these things, and I know, I and I hope and trust that many of you have as well. And what I mean by that, I hope that you have been to the nation of Israel. I hope you have visited Israel and seen it for yourself. You know, often when I was taking tours to Israel, uh, we would get up in the morning, we would eat breakfast, get on the bus, and because we had such a busy day and we're going to see so many things, we kept our devotions very short. And usually would just read a passage or two and, and have a short discussion and prayer, and off we would go. Well, inevitably, I would pick Psalm 102, and, and I'll, I'll share with you another in a moment, um, because of the intimacy that it describes, the feelings, the emotions that it conjures up uh, for anybody who, who has been to the land. And um, if, if you have been, you'll recognize what I'm going to say. Uh, it says, your servants take pleasure in her stones and show favor in her dust. Uh, for those of you who've been there, you know that, that sensation, that feeling of the gravel, the stones crunching under your feet when you walk off of the, the pavement and onto the land uh, of Israel. Uh, the, the, and that dust, you know, if you go to Israel any time between April and October, uh, there's very little chance there's going to be rain and dust collects over that course of the spring and summer and right into, into early fall. So you get dust on your shoes and dust on your pants. And, 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 you know, that land, because it's set apart for God, holy means set apart for God's purposes. Every inch of that land is set apart for God to accomplish his purposes. So that, that dust is holy. Those stones are holy. You know what I'm talking about if you've been there. You come home, if you, if you wear a different pair of shoes home and you've packed your shoes, you come home with the dust still on your shoes. And it, there's something special, there's something holy about it. And I believe that is the emotion that this psalm captures when we talk about um, c c talking about the dust and the stones of Israel. And one more passage I want to share with you from uh, our devotions is one that I would always choose to, to read, and that is Psalm 48, because it says, Walk about Zion, go all around her, count her towers, Mark well her bulwarks, consider her palaces, that you may tell it to the generation following. 
for this is God, our God forever and ever. He will be our guide even to death. He will be our guide. He, he, this is God. I, you know, I can't express to you strongly enough the fact that when you walk around Israel and you view all these things, you are viewing God. You are viewing His faithfulness. You're seeing His hand, His spirit, His desires coming to fold. It, it, is, it is so real and tangible right before your eyes. You can see God in all of his glory by the fulfillment of his word in the nation of Israel. Walking around and telling, oh, speaking, of, it says, tell the next generation. You know, I've had this experience of bringing young people to the land of Israel, uh, and it's one of my greatest rewards to pass along to the next generation this, this uh, knowledge and this understanding of what God is doing in the land. And I remember having a couple of college students walk with me along the walls of the old city one evening as I, I shared with them uh, just kind of a private tour. In the evenings, I like taking a walk, and they wanted to go with me. And as we came out of the old city and we're walking back toward the hotel, this young college girl said, you know, in, in Bible school, in, in uh, Sunday school, and in Bible classes, we learned as children the stories of this place. But now I'm seeing that it's real. It's not just stories for kids. This is real. This is tangible. I can see it. I can experience it. And she's right. And I'm so glad that I could be a part of that revelation or that sharing that moment in her life. And uh, I would love to do it with, with many, many more because it is real. It is tangible. It is God. All right, with that, we've got to take a short break right here, and we'll be right back. It is hard to imagine in this day and age that many Jewish people in remote parts of the world still lack the basic human necessities you and I take for granted and suffer discrimination due to their Jewish heritage. Even though the wall of communism has fallen, many Jewish people around the world live in conditions that deprive them of freedom and opportunity they so deserve. In the Bible, God prophesied over 300 times that He would restore the Jewish people to their land and specifically called Gentiles to help. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will lift up my hand in an oath to the nations and set my standard for the peoples. They shall bring your sons in their arms and your daughters shall be carried on their shoulders. The restoration of Israel isn't our idea. It's God's. Since 1995, Ezra International supporters have helped over 77,000 people from around the world. The good news is, a gift of $30 per month for a year can help a Jewish person return to Israel. Say yes. I want to be used by God to assist in the prophetic return of His precious Jewish people to the biblical homeland. Call the number below or visit EzraInternational.org and send your gift of hope today. Okay, before the break, I was talking about walking around Zion, walking around Israel and seeing it for yourself and how real it is and how tangible it is and the fact that um, God says, you know, he, even He will be our guide and we need to tell this to the next generation. Speaking of guides, um, I, I had a conversation, an interesting conversation on my first trip to Israel. And all this is to say, you know, talk to you about how, how it is that we can bring Jewish people back to the land. And it's all very practical. It doesn't look like a miracle, but it is. But I was talking to my guide at the end of our tour, and it was my first trip in 1993. And I said to him, his name was Yehuda. I said, Yehuda, you have a beautiful country here. And he looked at me. And he says, yes, but you're looking at the country through rose-colored glasses. And that response surprised me. Here we have a member of the, uh, the ministry of tourism 
trying to put on the best face of Israel for us. And to have him say something like that, that to me surprised me. It set me back a bit. And I don't know if he had said it to others or if he'd recognized something in my, my hunger and, and desire to learn more about the land. But uh, it, that's what it, exactly what it did. It helped motivate more hunger, more desire to do everything I, I could do to learn what he meant by that. And I did for the next, uh, well, from that time forward. But for, for a period of time, I was volunteering in Israel. I was learning about Judaism. I was learning about the people. I was learning their history. I was studying current events and how they affected, uh, uh, how they were presented and how they affected the people there. Um, went back a number of times, went back on another tour with Yehuda. Um, then later began to lead tours myself. And of course, I would always give Yehuda a call and say, you know, we're coming and get him lined up for the tour. Ten years passed. In 2003, I had been doing all these things for, for ten years and said to Yehuda, you know, ten years ago you said something to me and I want to I wanna ask you about it. And, and I asked him, do you remember the conversation when I said you have a beautiful country? And he did. He said, yes, and I told you you were looking through rose-colored glasses. And I said, yes, and I said, for the last 10 years, I've been coming back, I've been doing my homework, I've been studying, I've been experiencing the land, and I want to tell you something. You have a beautiful country here. And he got a big smile on his face, and he says, you know, you're right. Because he just wanted me to understand it from a practical view, and not just from, you know, the fact that when you're on tour, you have... Uh, everything is done for you. You have your food in the morning, you're, you have transportation provided for you, you have a beautiful place to stay. And so it is uh, a bit um, different on tour than it is living there in reality. But I had done my homework, I had studied it out, and he, um, he realized that uh, you know, through, through proper lenses, it's still a beautiful country, and God is there. And one more story, quick story about Yehuda uh, in his memory and in his honor. Um, he would take us, as all guys would, if you request to go to Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Memorial, Holocaust Museum. When he took us there, he shared his experience not as a Holocaust survivor, per se, not as one who went to the camps, not as one who went to uh, the, the labor camps or any of the uh, other um, execution camps. Um, he survived because his dad had the foresight to send him to England to stay with relatives and to send another brother to the United States to stay with relatives. And he said something happened to him that is different than those who um, experienced it firsthand it, you know, by surviving in those camps. But he realized later, when all of the other young men his age were gathering for holidays and having family members, you know, grandparents and, and aunts and uncles gathered together, he realized he had none. He had lost his grandparents, had lost his, his family, all, the, all of his aunts and uncles in the Holocaust, Holocaust, and therefore had no one to gather on the holidays like the other people, the other friends of his around him. Uh, so God, God um, rest your soul, Yehuda. I miss you. Um, I want to share with you a little bit more about this final, uh, this, this evidence that we are living in the day when God said he would restore Israel and he would turn his favor back to them. In Zephaniah chapter 3, verses uh verse 9, it says, For then I will restore to the peoples a pure language that they may call on the name of the Lord to serve him in one accord. The, na the nation of Israel uh, was restored and the, la the language, the Hebrew language was restored and uh, just in fulfillment of the word of God. He also said in Zephaniah verse 19 of chapter 3, Behold at that time, I will deal with all who afflict you. I will save the lame. I will gather those who are driven out. I will appoint them for praise and fame. In every land where they were put to shame, at that time I will bring you back. Even at that time I will gather you, 
for I will give you fame and praise among all the peoples and of the earth when I return your captives before your eyes, says the Lord. No longer are the, 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 those in Israel um, put to shame, but many of us love them and care about them very much, just as the word of God uh, said it would. Amos verse 9 Amos verse 9, verse 14 through 15 says this, I will bring back the captives of my people Israel. They shall, be built, they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them. They will plant vineyards and drink wine from them. They shall also make gardens and eat fruit from them. I will plant them in their land and no longer shall they be pulled up from the land which I have given them, says the Lord. No longer pulled up. I, I, I emphasize this passage because I want to share with you quickly before, in the little bit of time we have left is that don't buy into this idea that is taught in much of Christian eschatology that Israel is going to be uh, destroyed again or two-thirds of the Jewish people are going to die and the last third will, will know, the, know God. That is a false eschatology. I mean, how? what kind of sick joke would it be for God to bring them back to the land, say he'd bring him his favor back to them, the time to, for favor and mercy to be back upon them and their land, only to have two-thirds of them destroyed or killed in some type of war. That's not what the Word of God says. That prophecy comes from Zechariah chapter 13, and many of your Bibles will say, uh, two thirds. I'll read. I'll read the passage, verse eight and nine of chapter thirteen. And it shall come to pass in all the land, says the Lord, that two thirds in it shall be cut off and die. That is a bad translation. Some of your Bibles have it right. It should be two parts because that coincides with the two uh, times that Israel was was there, scattered and returned. The Israel of today is the third commonwealth to exist in that, in that land, in that region. The third commonwealth of Israel, twice scattered, twice returned. So it should read that two parts shall be cut off and die. Twice scattered is the interpretation. If you look at, let scripture interpret scripture. And says, and then one third or one part, the third part is a better translation, shall be left in it. I will bring the third part through the fire. Your Bible might say one third, but it's the third part. That's the third commonwealth of Israel that is there today. And will refine them as silver is refined and test them as gold is tested. And they will call on my name. I will answer them. I will say, this is my people. And each one will say, the Lord is my God. That is our God who has turned his mercy and his favor back to the people and to the nation of Israel, just as he promised he would. And he is not going to scatter them again. He is not going to destroy two-thirds of them. They are there to stay. They are going to survive every test that is thrown at them, every war that comes their way, and God will see them through it and they are there to stay. He will not pluck them up again. So this is why Ezra International can confidently bring his people home and know that he, he is taking care of them. They will come to know him again when they return home to their homeland. So we can confidently do our work and know, rest assured, that God will be doing his part. He's called upon us to, to partner with him. He wants us to partner with him. He doesn't need us, but he desires us. He desires our participation. So we have partnered with God in bringing his people home. And you too can partner with God as you partner with Ezra International in anything that we do to bring his people home. Please go to our website, check us out, see what you can do. God bless you. Thank you. I'm out of time, but thank you for, for joining me today, and I hope to see you next time. Shalom.